Well, it is a joy for me. I can't hear you. There's too many. It's muddled. <laughs> okay, okay. I only have 50 minutes, so shush it. Shush it. I only have 50. You're not taking that from me. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Romans chapter 11. I think it's important um, that you see that uh, ultimately, um, I'll say some things tonight and hopefully those things line up with the Word of God, whatever. If somebody opens the Bible and then they don't kind of plant themselves in it, they kind of open the Bible and then come over here and say what they want, then you have to navigate and filter through that. And so what I wanna do is I just wanna stay tethered and, and I've come tonight uh, with a ton of excitement in my own heart. See, I, I grew up in a home uh, where my father was abusive in just about every way you could be abusive and then my mother was um, super religious. I mean, followed the rules. In fact, she thought um, that the Pharisees went a little bit too light on the law, that they were a little too loose and they probably could have been a bit tighter in their application. And so I grew up in this home where uh, my father's uh, abusive and my mother's hyper religious and I learned early on to hate both sides of the equation I didn't want to give myself over to worldliness because I saw what where that ended with my daddy and I definitely didn't love um, Jesus Christ because I can tell you this if mom's God is the God of the universe I don't want any part of him now in the midst of all of that Jesus didn't care and through the testimony of a friend in high school um, Christ wooed me and saved me and after my conversion I can just no doubt in my my heart, no doubt, in my mind, loved Jesus. Had a t-shirt that said, I heart Jesus. I was in. I'm sharing the gospel. I'm reading the Bible. I'm grabbing every book I can. I'm devouring, trying to figure out how Jesus got me. I didn't even know how it worked. I was a, a, a skeptic and a critic and, and looked at mom and was like, that's ridiculous. And the next thing I know, I was raising my hand and crying at a church camp. And so I wanted to know what he did to me. So I would just read and read and read. And here's what, here's what happened to me. Um, and, and maybe you can relate, maybe you can't, maybe you're just godlier than, than I was, but, but I found very quickly after that that although I loved Jesus Christ and there was no doubt about my love for Christ, I continued um, to stumble forward. I had real issues with lust, I had real issues with anger, and it didn't take long for me to learn how to act like a Christian and not feel safe confessing the fact that I had some areas of my life that were really dark and really broken broken, and, and so really, I played the part, man. I'm going to church. In fact, in, in 1997, I was teaching the Bible to other people while simultaneously having this kind of duplicitous life where I was struggling with doubt and fear and anger and lust and really didn't know, am I a Christian? Am I not? I mean, I love Jesus. I know that I love him, but why do I keep struggling like this? Why do I keep falling? I'm such an awful person. And so uh, a friend of mine said, hey, they're, they're doing this deal down in Austin, all right? It's this this thing called passion, this dude named Louis Giglio, you ought to come with us. And so uh, I hopped in with a crew and I went um, to Passion uh, 97 and I'm sitting out there in the crowd. It did not look like this. Uh, it, it did not look like this. Uh, it was awesome, but not arena awesome yet. And, and so I'm sitting out in the crowd and this uh, older dude comes out wearing a tweed jacket, looking like he's about 117 years old um, and just dry. Like, like it's like humor bothered him. And I come to find out later that was actually true. And um, he, he opened up the Bible and here I am in this duplicitous life. I know when to raise my hand. I know I'm supposed to take notes. I even know to do that thing when we're singing songs that occasionally I need to pat my chest and go, mm. mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that, there I am. And, and that night, um, Dr. John Piper opened up the word of God and preached it and the Holy Spirit blew me up. And here's how he blew me up, because it's my intent, my hope, the reason I'm excited about tonight is, is I felt awful and, and I felt like um, that I'd failed the Lord and I felt like uh, I was such a hypocrite and, I was, and that, so that's where I, I was. And John, when he opened up the Word of God and read it, he didn't come and go, no, 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 you're special. No, he like the Holy Spirit reinforced all of that. You are awful. You are a hypocrite. You do give yourself over to things that I despise and are despicable. And so I felt the weight of that. And I began to weep, like ugly weep, like make your friends around you comfortable, uncomfortable weep. And then what God said next via that sermon changed the entire trajectory of my life. 
It changed how I interact with my wife, how I'm raising my children, how I fight sin, the kind of pastor I've become, my belief in how to preach the word of God, all was shaped. My ability to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, all changed when through that sermon, through the Holy Spirit's power, in the midst of God going, you are a sinner, you are broken, you are a hypocrite, you are giving yourself over to things that I hate. He then said, now, stop looking at you and look at me. Stop looking at you and look at now, look how awesome I am. Look how big I am, look how mighty I am, look how sufficient I am, look how gracious I am. Now, Matt, do you feel how all that doubt, all that fear, that anger, that lust starts to give way when you let go of you and you start gazing upon me? And so what I wanna do, because I'm not an idiot, I'm not, and I know, well, jury's out, bro, you've only been going for like five minutes, Here's what I know. I know some of you in here and you're, you're just like me, duplicitous life. You're, you're church kids, but you're, you're, not, you're not really loving the Lord. You're not really following the Lord. You feel trapped in your sins. I know in 2004 at the Village Church, we were um, growing and blowing and we were young, crazy young for all the, um, it's sexy to have a young church. I, I'll, as a pastor, want to tell you it was a nightmare. And so a bunch of 22-year-olds sitting around talking about life, what they think about life, that's just a nightmare. And, and so um, I kept getting into conversations with 20 year olds who kind of were where I had been. Man, I'm really struggling with doubt, Chandler. I'm, I'm really confused, I don't know. I've got friends talking to me about this and what am I supposed to do with this? And does the Bible really say this? And can I trust the Bible and what about this? And so I thought it'd be a great idea to do a series on doubt. And so I stood up in front of our congregation and I said, here's what we're gonna do. We're, we're gonna do a series on doubt. So I want you to take um, the, the little welcome card and I want you to flip it over on the back of the welcome card. Uh, I want you to write, this is what I struggle with. You don't have to sign your name, so be completely honest. Here's my doubt, here's my struggle, here's my wrestle, here's what I'm afraid of, here's what I just can't seem to believe, here's what's not working. And they filled it out and I just said, hey, drop it in the joy boxes on your way out and we'll take a look at them and build out the series. And that weekend, it looked like we raised $40 billion. I mean, just the offering bags were just jammed with cards. Really, we had $7 in change and the entire congregation was like, I don't know if I'm saved. So I was like, well, winning as a pastor, winning. So we went to my office and, and we started just throwing them out on the floor and the staff came in and we're just kind of making piles and we're like, we cannot do a four year series on doubt. What kind of epic, meticulous beatdown would four years on doubt be for members of our church? And so we said, instead, let's kind of categorize these. That's okay, here's a certain kind of doubt, a doubt in the inerrancy of the word of God. So let's make a pile, we'll do a week on can the Bible be trusted? Uh, here's, a, here's another pile, and then let's make a pile there. And, and, then, and the biggest pile, like the Mount Everest's of piles was the one that kind of goes back to my own history. If I am a believer in Christ, if the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, if I truly have been adopted and am blood bought, why do I struggle like I do? Why do I doubt like I do? Why do I wrestle? Why do I keep falling into these patterns that I know are giving myself over to the things that the Lord hates? And so the Roots of Doubt series was born. I think we have since took that offline because I had a lot of youthful angst back then um, that, that just was inappropriate, and so we pulled that. Um, but it was awesome. It was an amazing sermon series. And, and so what I wanted to do when we got into that week, that was the last week of the series, and what I wanted to do is what I want to do tonight. Let me get your eyes off of you. And so I don't know what you think of you. I hope you don't have a, a, an elevated uh, picture of yourself, like, because I've always said this, like, no one has lied to you more than you have. No one has betrayed you more than you have. Nobody has been more cruel to you than you. And you might be like, well, you don't know my daddy, you don't know, no, hey, listen, I don't need to know your daddy. Your daddy could be a worthless piece of carbon and your response to his wickedness is still on you. Your response is, is still on you. God will deal with him. And so nobody, you're not awesome. I'm not gonna coddle you like, I'm like, come here, you're great. You're not great. In fact, I would argue the greater you think you are, the more enslaved you are to your perceived greatness. And the more that we see God is great and God is mighty and God is beautiful and God is good, then we're free. 
Then we can fight. Then we walk in victory. Then our doubts begin to dissipate. We'll still fight them. Listen, if you've bought into some sort of romanticized fairy tale of our faith, I want to try by the Holy Spirit's power to shake you out of it. Like the Apostle Paul says, I'm perplexed but not crushed. Now let's chat. Paul is better than you. Like we pray for sick people. How many of you have ever prayed for somebody who is sick? Right? You get your, okay, now we've prayed. Paul doesn't roll like that. Paul walks up like, get up. You're not sick. You're not allowed to be dead. Here's my handkerchief. Touch somebody with that. Uh, I mean, he's different than we are. And if the apostle Paul had been to the third heaven, I don't even know where that is. I've done the exit Jesus. I don't know. And if the apostle Paul can say, I'm perplexed. I don't get this. I don't understand what you're doing here, God. Then surely we will. I ain't been to the third heaven. I did not get saved by Jesus kicking me off a horse, be like, hey man, you're following me the rest of your life. That's not how it happened to me. And yet, Paul, the author of so much of the New Testament says, I'm perplexed. I mean, I'm not, I'm not crushed because I know where my eyes go. I'm not crushed, but I am perplexed. I'm confused, I don't know how this works. And so what I wanna do, four things about God that I think will anchor your soul. I hope for the rest of your life as you wrestle with your doubts, as you fight against your flesh, as you seek to make much of the name and renown of Jesus Christ, four anchors in, in a beautiful, strange text. Romans 11, 33 through 36, as the Apostle Paul ties off uh, the first 11 chapters of Romans, most of which are spent on you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, everybody's a sinner. Nobody gets out clean, everybody's guilty. Now everyone is guilty of treason against the God of the universe. Even if you're a church kid, mom gave birth to you right out on the altar, pastor spanked you, first word was Jesus, <laughs> baptized right there, and you have lived a life of upright where you don't cuss except Christian cuss words, you know, like ding fod, some kind of invented word. <laughs> You have a quiet time every morning. You, like, you, you, you're living that out. Even in that, you're living a life of self-sufficiency that says, I don't need you, God. I'll be my God. Guilty. Nobody gets out clean. So Christ swoops in and rescues us out of that. And Paul, captivated and caught up in the Holy Ghost, pens this. Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Now, four things out of this text. By the way, this text is strange because the Apostle Paul is not given over to poetry often. Like, you know, in 2 Peter, Peter writes that Paul is hard to understand. Like when the Bible says, yeah, Romans is tough. Then you know that you're going to read some stuff by Paul and go, I don't quite get it. But in this place, captivated by the glory of Christ, he gives himself over to poetry, and, and here's how he starts. Four things about God that if we look at them, marvel, get them into our guts, not just kind of take notes, but get them into our guts, will change and anchor our souls through life's peaks and valleys, whatever the Lord has for us. It starts with this, oh, the depth of his riches. So number one, God's transcendent wealth. God transcendent wealth. We gotta get our eyes on that. Psalm 50 verse 10 says this, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, this worked really well in a day and age that was driven by agriculture. I know we're in Texas, but I'm guessing almost all of us, our lives aren't dependent on cattle. So we, we get in our cars, we don't need cows to help us work. But in this period of time, he who had the cattle drove commerce. And so he, he says here that, that all the power, the wealth, economics belong to our God. In fact, I like Deuteronomy 10, 14 a bit better because it helps us get our mind around the wealth of God. Deuteronomy 10, 14, behold, 
to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth that is and all that is in it. I, I love this verse because what Deuteronomy is saying in what, what Moses is writing there is not just heaven, but the heaven of heavens belongs to God. So when we look up at the stars, we're seeing this kind of tiny little piece of the universe. We're like, wow, that's vast. In fact, it blew David's mind, right? When I look at the stars, what is, what is man that you are mindful of, the son of man that you care? And God's like, hey, 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 hey. Like, I, I, I love that you're digging the Milky Way here, but listen, the heavens of the heavens of the heavens, those are mine too. In fact, as far as there is, it's mine. Abraham Kuyper said it like this, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. So everything is his, that God owns everything, and he owns it differently than you and I own it. See, you and I are stymied in our creativity. We are blocked. There's a ceiling we hit because we need resources enabled to create. So if you're a writer, your ability to write hinges upon the language you know, the dictation you know, your, your ability to get ways to write. You need, you can't create them out of nothing. You must have things in order to create. If you are a painter, you are hemmed in. Your ceiling is the colors that exist. You will not, no matter how gifted of an artist you are, create a new color. It's not coming for you. I'm not saying you're not lights out, artsy, and tight jeans right now. I'm saying that you're not creating a new color. That you will be hemmed in by your canvas. If you are in construction, you can only build what you can afford to build and what resources are available to you. Listen to me. God's wealth doesn't work like that. God creates out of nothing anything he wants and as much of it as he wants at any time that he wants to do it. He is wholly other than us when it comes to wealth. So Bill Gates, Rockefeller, Jay-Z, everybody, they, they've got bills. I mean, they've got money. I'm not trying to take away from their wealth, but their wealth is dependent upon creation, yet our God's wealth goes well beyond creation because he is the creator. If he wanted to make a new color, he would. And if he wanted to create a new animal, he would. And if he wanted to build a, a billion, trillion dollar mansion somewhere in the world, he'd just tell it to do it. So don't think of the creation narrative as like heaven got really crowded. I'm like, golly, where are we going to all these stars in the living room, Jesus? Spirit, what is that? Well, it's kind of a platypus. It's a duck, but it's also a beaver, and it's got a... It's not, and there's like, get it out of here. Let's put it in the universe. That's not what happened. There was nothing until God said something. And that was so powerful to this day, the universe continues to expand in every direction. Yes, our God's wealth is transcendent. If you see this, if you meditate on this, if you get this in your gut, that God is never in a panic, he's never wondering how to get you through college, he's not worried about what kind of job you're gonna get, he's not, he's not built like that. When we begin to trust his provision, anxiety begins to give way. We can rest. Like Jesus says, hey, look at the birds. Look at them. They ain't got no 401k. They're doing all right. Doing all right. They got no health insurance. They're all right. I got you. God's transcendent wealth. And, and it doesn't stop there. In fact, this is one of my favorites. I just so hunker down in this one. Not only is God transcendent in his wealth, but we see next that he is sovereign in his knowing. It says, oh, the depths of his riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. So how deep is the wisdom and knowledge of God? Here's what I, I wrote here. God knows every word in every language, in every sentence, in every paragraph, in every chapter of every book, every ever written. He knows every fact of history, past and future, every bit of truth discovered and undiscovered. He knows it all. There is nothing that he does not know. Truths known and truths unknown to be discovered later, God knows. It's why as the people of God, we never need to be afraid of what is true, ever. 
in our day and age, a lot of people are trying to pit science against faith, and the reality is there's an overlap there that cannot be denied. In fact, the Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 23. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul says it, or Apollos says it, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future. All truth is yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This means the truth is never our enemy, because if it is true, it is from God, and we are in Christ, and Christ is of God. So if it's true, it's ours that we have, if you will, cornered the market on truth. And so what are we to do with statements that seem to contradict the word of God? Because in our faith, we're saying the word of God is an error, and it's without error. How are we to handle that? I'll tell you how I often handle it. I don't, I don't know. I'm gonna trust the Lord and let's wait. It's interesting to watch, especially in this day and age, science keep catching up with the Bible. So just give it a little bit of time. Sociologically, this is absolutely true. We're even starting to find out biologically this is true. Just get it a little bit. Now that we've mapped the human genome, you, you know what they're finding is that whether, regardless of what color we are, our genetic DNA is 99.9% .9 identical, which traces back to a single origin, like there was a single man that maybe we all came from. <laughs> Welcome to Genesis 1, bro. Welcome to Genesis 1. So I don't want to argue. Listen, I can't argue with scientists. They're brilliant. I mean, they like where they were eight years old and wanted an Encyclopedia Britannica, Google that later, uh, so that they could read it. I'm not smart enough to argue with them, but I can wait. I can wait. I can wait, so don't be deceived by that. Now, since all truth is ours, because we are of Christ and Christ is uh, the sovereign God, I want you to roll this around in your head because uh, although it sounds simple to say that God's knowledge and wisdom are, are deep, it, it, it's spectacular to consider how this works itself out. So what we know from the word of God is that God knows everything that's going on at a micro level in the universe. Every cell, every atom, every bit of mitosis, the stuff that's going on in those things. God's aware of every bit of that. It never surprises him. He never gets confused. He never didn't see that coming. He knows it all, but he also knows it all at a macro level, which is all over the universe. He knows the orbits of planets. He knows the temperature of stars. He is aware of everything at the micro level and the macro level, and he does this without any strain on his brain. He's not like, golly, what did I tell Pluto to do? Spirit, remember, get into Evernote. What did I say? Okay, Pluto's over there now, right? That's not how he works. Everything micro, everything macro, he's got it. But on top of that, and this is my, it blows the mind, in addition to the exhaustive depth of his knowledge is the extensive or exhaustive breadth of it. God knows every event that has ever occurred and how that event led to other events that created other events that caused other events that created other events that moved into other events that created other events that started to do other events. He knows it all. He, he knows how moments lead to other moments. He knows how situations lead to other situations. He knows how the highs and lows of life are shaped and molded and create, when all said and done, a panorama of his beauty and glory and might. See, Romans 11, tells us that instead that God is incomprehensibly immense, exceedingly expansive and eternally powerful. And so much... So that time and time again, our response to many of the things of God ought to be, look at me, because this is okay to say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And, and that moves us to the next part of the text. How inscrutable are his ways? Inscrutable, it, that you can't scrutinize God. 
You can't scrutinize them, and here's why you can't scrutinize God. Time and time again, when men in the Bible try to bring God's sovereign rule under scrutiny, God will sometimes lovingly engage them, and the result is terrifying. So Job, kind of frustrated at his lot, I mean, if you know the story of Job, God takes everything but his wife, and his wife turns out to be a nagging woman. This is like, why don't you curse God and die, you fool? Like, I would have like, Lord, give me my dog back and take this woman. And so he, here's what, God, Job's kind of railing his fist a little bit of, God, I don't get this, I don't understand what you're doing. And so God answers him. Can you imagine? Like being in your room going, Lord, I, still, I feel like you betrayed me. You didn't show up. I don't know what you're doing here. And God answered Job. Job 38, verse two. Imagine the terror. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You tell me if you have understanding. So um, God is so unscrutable, inscrutable, that to go, what are you doing, is kind of a fool's errand because when the Lord steps into that space, he's like, well, you know what? Since you were there when I laid the foundation of the earth, why don't you tell me how things should be? And then all over the Bible, one of the things that I think happens in the Bible that we resist, but we need to give ourselves over to, is God wants you to feel small. All this time spent on looking strong, that's not what God's after. You're not strong. In fact, the Bible's brutal about this, James 4, 14. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And then um, Romans 9, verse 20. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Now, I'll tell you why even more. Give you an illustration that'll help you understand why we need to look at the cross and say, the cross proves that God is for me, I'm gonna trust him. Um, my, my son really digs kind of Lord of the Rings Hobbit stuff. Yeah, you guys can get together and dress up like nerds all day, just come on over. But that, that's 18 hours of film. You've got the three Lord of the Rings, each one like nine and a half hours a piece. And, and then he rolled it back into the Hobbit, did the prequel, totally George Lucas us. And, and now you've got, in that two trilogies, 18 hours of film. When you scrutinize God, here's what it's like. It's like you'd never seen any of those 18 hours. I brought you into the theater and let you watch four seconds. That's probably generous. I give you two seconds to look at the screen, and then I walk you back outside and go, tell me about those 18 hours. Now, whatever you say is going to be wrong. You're like, I don't know, hairy-footed midgets. I, I, it may be with a sword, it's about jewelry. Like you wouldn't know. And so the alpha and the omega, he has always been, he will always be, he knows all events and how everything weaves together. Think how crazy we are that at 22, heck at 40, heck at 85, do we go, what are you doing? His ways are inscrutable. The question is, will we believe and trust that he's loving and it goes on from there, Romans eleven thirty four. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Okay, so Paul's not looking for an answer from somebody. As this is read in the church at Rome, somebody's not gonna go, oh, oh, I did, I counseled him. I know, I know the mind of the Lord. Now you know a little bit of the mind of the Lord in that he has given you his word and he has given you his word so that you might see him for who he is. But no one knows so much that they get to counsel God. You get to kind of huddle, hey, come here, Father. Um, I see kind of this thing you're doing over here, and it looks great. I don't want to take anything from you. Like, that looks legit. But what about, I don't know if you've thought about this, but I've been thinking, in fact, a couple of my buddies, we were talking over there, and we think, what if, what if you just started another, like, like a third great awakening, and we could just forget about all this? Just an idea. Think about it. Talk amongst yourselves. Be over here. Just consider it, right? You, you can't counsel God. He doesn't need your counsel. I mean, come on, some of you are like making two fours, you know, 2.4 in college going, God, here's what I would do. <laughs> no, so look, quick quiz. How many of you have a thing that you pled with God for and now years later you're like, thank you, Jesus, you did not give that to me? Anybody? Okay, so keep your hands, look around. Just a bunch of morons. <laughs> Please, God, I need it. 
You think he's trying to keep from you things you need? You think that's the kind of God he is? Like the Israelites, you let us out in the desert to die. Was this just bread from heaven? Water coming out of a rock, are you serious again? No, 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 he doesn't need your counsel. That doesn't mean we don't cry out, that doesn't mean we don't plead, that doesn't mean we don't ask. It means we have to see him for who he is, the depths of his riches and his wisdom and his knowledge and that he's inscrutable in his sovereign reign because he knows more than we could ever know and that it could be trusted that he is good. We know that in knowing he is working all things for our good and his glory. If you know that, you know there's no panic in the Godhead. So I, I need to address this because it's real life. Like some of you, really bad things have happened. And so when you hear a sermon like this and you've been abused or you hear a sermon like this and you got sick, you hear a, a sermon like this and something really dark happened to you and you're like, I'm trying to get that. I'm trying to understand that, Chandler but I don't know, I don't know if I can believe that. Because if that's true, I'm trying to reconcile, trying to reconcile in my head that this sovereign king is good and he allowed this. If you're telling me he could have stepped into space, if you're telling me he could have stopped this, if you're telling me that he is sovereign over all things, especially events in his wisdom and knowledge, I do have some scrutiny. Because what happened to me was terrible and I hadn't hardly recovered and I don't know that I ever will recover. I wanna take that from you because it is hard. We do live in a Genesis 3 world, but listen to me. God does not drive an ambulance. He does not show up after and try to put the pieces back together. God wounds us like a surgeon and he can be trusted because we look to the cross of Christ and in looking at the cross of Christ, our confidence that he is for us and not against us grows as we know he's at work in the mess. In fact, the Bible is just one of the grittiest, nastiest books I've ever read. It's grotesque and the reason why the Bible's filled with so much doubt and death and disease and brokenness is because God's trying to tell you, I'm at work in the mess. It's not that there won't be one, it's that I'm with you in it and I'm redeeming and reconciling and working and I have not abandoned you and I'm not showing up late. I'm with you, I am for you. Look to the cross. I think I gave my life, bled out my blood, sent my son because I don't love you, because I'm cruel. No, I'm for you, I am not against you. I am with you. We see God's knowledge and then from there we see God's perfect self-sufficient let's see look at Romans eleven thirty-five. or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid so if if as we've covered everything that exists is God and he is sovereign in all of his knowing and this is so this was one of those things that set my heart free look right at me it's hard to believe I can't give him anything to win his affection. Um, at, around my birthday and Christmas, um, my, my kids will want some money to buy me something for my birthday. So I've gotta think, how generous do I wanna be to me? Right, and so the, the, my, my kids will take my money and, and then they'll go and they'll buy me a gift and then they'll bring me back the gift that I bought for me for my own birthday. So the gifts are great, but I didn't get any richer, right? This is a C.S. Lewis illustration. This is, if you remember the band, Sixpence None the Richer, that, that they got that from a C.S. Lewis illustration where he says that trying to give to God is like a child getting his allowance from his dad and then bringing back to him, you know, getting a sixpence from their father and then bringing back to the dad a gift. The father is sixpence none the richer. So let me tell you why this is so, such good news. If you cannot Put God in your debt. If you cannot buy him off with good behavior, then you are free to be loved by him for what he has done and not what you do. I think you guys missed that because that was good. Right? Because if you've come in here and you're exhausted and you're trying to do all that you're supposed to do, I don't know if the rules change, but when I was in college, you had to be learning to play the acoustic guitar. God knows you couldn't love Jesus if you weren't trying to learn to play the acoustic guitar. You gotta read my utmost for his highest. You, you probably have to own a Hillsong CD. You, you better at least, John Piper better be somewhere on your radar. Love him or hate him, you gotta at least have an opinion about him. 
And so, so many of us, we get caught in this checklist mentality that does not bring life and does not bring freedom. And then what ends up happening, here's what's so horrible. When you do everything you think you, he wants you to do and something bad happens, you feel betrayed by him because you're good and you're doing what you're supposed to do and you know people that these should happen to, but not you because you're waking up every morning and you're having your quiet time. Shoot, you did a Beth Moore Bible study this year. How dare he? Your roommate? That girl? Why not her? She ain't doing no Beth Moore Bible study. Well, why not? Why not my friend? I'm not going out and getting plastered on the weekends. I'm not doing those things. These people are, and yet you're coming at me like this, Lord? Man, I pray. I even fasted from television for half an hour on Thursday. I DVR'd it, Lord, but you knew my heart. So you think what you're doing with your behavior is you're putting God in your debt. You owe me. Look at me, I love you. He owes you nothing. He owes you nothing, which makes his gracious giving to us unbelievable. Like he owes you nothing and look what he gets. Look at the common grace he gives all men. Think of how many people hate him, belittle him, mock him, and they get to laugh. And they get to get married, they get to eat good food, they get to drink good wine, they get to have sex, they get to, they get to enjoy good friendships. And they hate the creator of all those things and still in his mercy he gives the gifts of common grace. See, he owes you nothing and he's granted you everything. Get your eyes on that. You can't give to him to put him in your debt. There's freedom there. I get to just chase him. I get to just love him. I get to just marvel at his generosity to me. God is perfect in his self-sufficiency. He does not need you ultimately to give anything to him. And I wanna be straight with you. If you have to give something to him to make him whole, I'm not worshiping him anymore. I mean, I'm just looking in the room, just love you, you're cute, you're not impressive. So if I'm like, okay, you guys have got a complete God, I've got a complete, like how can God help me if I have to complete him? He's utterly and completely self-sufficient. He gives out of his grace, not out of his need. And then finally, and I'll spend my last few minutes with you here, the last thing we see in verse 36 is God's glorious self-regard. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever, amen. So I wanna, I wanna talk. God wants to bless you. He wants to give to you. God is for you, not against you. The Bible says all these things, but there's something underneath all of that generosity that we had better anchor in on. So I, I don't wanna say God doesn't love you. I think God loves you. I'm not gonna say God's not for you because I think he's for you. I'm not gonna say God doesn't wanna bless you. I think he wants to bless you, but I think there's something underneath all of that that we have to be tethered to if we're gonna get this freedom that we so desperately want. And I think the best way um, to show you that is Psalm 23, starting in verse one. Here's what it says. You, you know this, you have a coffee cup with this on it. If you graduated from a Christian school, you've got a t-shirt, a coffee cup, and a bookmark with this on it. Maybe a bumper sticker with a sheep and a shepherd on it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Now, right now, this text sounds like God is really into me, yo. I mean, God loves me. Leading me beside still water, give me some green grass. Give me a place to lay down. And, and yet, the motivation behind all of that goodness and grace, really to know that changes everything. So let's finish reading there in verse three. He leads me in paths of righteousness for what reason? For his namesake. See, the motivation behind God's blessing, the motivation behind God being for you, the motivation behind God's goodness towards you is for the sake of his name. If there's anything that the 268 generation is about, it's the name and the renown of Christ because that's what God is about, the name and renown of his name. The exaltation, the worship, the enjoyment, and the glory. In fact, the Bible is filled with God's motive being God. 
For the sake of his name, God did not destroy Israel in the desert. That's Ezekiel 20. God saves men for the sake of his name. That's Psalm 106. Pharaoh's heart was hardened for the glory of God. That's Exodus 14. The beginning of the Israeli monarch was about the glory of God. That's 1 Samuel 12. Solomon dedicated the temple for the glory of God. That's 1 Kings 8. Israel became great and powerful among the nations because God was making himself a name. That's 2 Samuel 7. God did not destroy Israel when it deserved to be destroyed because he did not want his name to be blasphemed among the nations. That's Isaiah 48. God decided to destroy the Israelites because they would not lay it to their heart to give glory to his name. That's Malachi 2. Jesus's life and ministry was about the glory of God. The cross of Jesus Christ is about the glory of God. You and I are saved for the praise of his glorious grace. That's Ephesians 1. The Christian life is about the reflection of the glory of God off of us into the universe. That's Matthew 5, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Peter 4. The second coming is about the consummation of all things to the glory of God. That's 2 Thessalonians. The consummation of all things is so that God might be praised. Revelation 21. God is about God. God is for God. And that is the best news in the universe. And it's the best news for you and for me and for everyone else in the world. And here's why. Two reasons as I close. God being for God, God being this, deep in riches, deep in wisdom and knowledge, inscrutable in his ways, worthy of praise. The reason that's such a big deal is since God is for God. That means all of the commands of God in scripture are about leading me into deeper life and not trying to take from me anything. See, God's not glorified by begrudging submission. You think that's what he's trying to, you think when God says, this is how sex works in the covenant of marriage. I mean, you think God's trying to, he ain't trying to take from you. He's trying to lead you into something, something better. All the commands of God in scripture are about leading you into life, not in trying to take from you anything. And that, we know that because God is for God. God is about the praise of his glorious grace. He's about us living, enjoying, and men in God amazing. It's about walking in his ways and finding the pleasure that, and that rolling past any experience and onto his name. See, singing's great, but if singing doesn't roll past itself and onto the creator of singing, who cares? And food is great, but if it doesn't roll past food into worship, then we wasted some time. See, all the commands, all the good gifts of God are meant to go past themselves and to him. It's why that we enjoy life more than those outside of the kingdom. It's not that they don't experience pleasure. It's that they can't get past the, the pleasure itself to the giver of the pleasure. And then the second reason why God being for God is such good news. Now, now listen to me, this is gonna go contrary to what the world's trying to disciple you in. If God is about God, look right at me, then it's not about me. And if it's not about me, think of how hard I am to offend when it's not about me. See, the more life is about you, the angrier you're gonna be, the more combative you're gonna be, the more stressed out you're gonna be, the more anxious you're gonna be, the more frustrated you're gonna be. And the more it's not about you, the more you get to breathe because it's not about you. See, if life's about you, then when you get on the road, why are you in the left lane going 40? Pa, pa, pa. That's Texas, we all carry. And, and so, right, we, well, get out of the way. You're waiting in line, you're like, sheesh, are you kidding me right now? Everything's personal. It's personal when you're driving. It's personal when a friend says something. It's personal. Everything's personal when it's about you. When it's not about you, you get to just breathe. You get to just breathe. And, and listen, I, I know most of us aren't married yet, but then if it's about you and you get married, man, there better be some things happening. You should better be doing this. He better be doing that. Got a list of things they better be doing because it's about you. But when it's not about you, you get to just breathe. You get set free to love and serve and be all that God has called you to be. It's a beautiful thing for it to not be about you. We get to rest in that. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I, I love in Romans 8, all these things are true. And so as it swells back in Romans 8, Paul says, he asks this crazy question that, that he really he answers in the next line. He says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? Since all of this is true, we can look to the cross and we know that God is these things and he's given to us, not because we've done anything, but out of the overflowing love and grace of his nature. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? Answer, no one, for it's God who justified. And so how should we think 
leaving here, if you've come in here and you've got doubts and fears, and I, I, I try to use this illustration often. Um, the Lord used it after my first daughter was born to really, really kind of ingrain in my heart how he sees me and how he uh, responds to me. Um, Audrey was born, she was, she was our firstborn, and when you have a firstborn kid, you can't wait for them to do things. And then your second kid, you can't, you're, you're all right if they're slow. And so uh, Audrey um, kind of made her way um, to the coffee table and, and she started to bounce, you know? She would just bounce there at the coffee table. We got really excited because we thought, hey, she's about to start walking. And so, you know, Lauren and I, we gotta got have a camera on us at all time, you know, host her it up, uh, you know, have a, get ready any moment she's going to walk. And, and then she would let go and she would kind of, you know, you could see her trying to figure it out and bless her heart, she, uh, it's probably my fault, she had this giant head and this tiny little skinny body. It looked like an orange on a snake. And, um, and, and one day she, she took her hands off there and there you could see the head kind of working her and her head fell forward. And if you're a science guy, you're gonna love this. Her giant head started to pull her, all right, this physics. And so she had two choices, stick out your foot or die. And so the head's pulling, she sticks out her foot, boom, now we're momentum. Step, 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 fall to the ground and we exploded. We're like, yeah, come on. Like she just won an Olympic gold medal. We picked her back up and we set her on there. We're like, come on, come on. We're calling everybody. She's walking, you're not gonna believe it. She's walking. And it, man, it was a celebration. I pulled out a sword, uncorked a bottle of champagne. I didn't, that's, uh, that'd be awesome though. That would be awesome. So we celebrated the fact that my daughter with a gargantuan head took three steps and fell to the ground. And it was huge. And so since then, I've got to watch a, a lot of my friends have their kids. And here's what I know about fathers. I have never yet come across the father, regardless of how pagan and evil, that sees their firstborn go step, 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 fall, and go, sheesh, kid's an idiot. <laughs> Baby, this is on you, because in my family we walk. <laughs> like I've seen your brother, there's some in y'all's genetic code. <laughs> no, 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 we rejoice, we're like, they're walking! Are you serious? They're walking. And you're not even mad. You pick the kid back up. You said, like, come on, come here. Come back to daddy, come on. And then they stumble again and they maybe get to you, maybe don't, they fall again. You pick them back up. And for the next few months, I mean, they're just nothing but bloody knees and elbows. And you don't care. You just keep picking them back up and going, now come on, come on. And then they get to that phase where they're running around, but they're clumsy. And then they get to the place where they're running around and they're not all that clumsy, but they still fall. And then you get to that place where they're, they're, they're grown and so they can run full speed, but every once in a while they still trip and, and scab their knees and bleed. But daddies always rejoice in the steps. Always. Could, could it be, could you imagine that that's how God sees you? They're walking. Do you see that? Angels, you checking this out? She's walking. Devils, they're like, look like a fat head fall to me. It's like, you shut your mouth. Walking. Walking, come on, get up, come on, come back to daddy. That's grace, that's grace paying the bill. So listen to me, I'm gonna say something crazy. I'm gonna say something crazy. By the grace of Christ, God does not love some future version of you. He loves you now, don't belittle his name. He doesn't just love you, this is crazy, he likes you. Can you believe that? Because I think we can imagine forgiveness. I just think, we think God likes the future version of us, the one that's more disciplined, the one that doesn't struggle like we do. The one, you're, you're belittling the cross of Christ when you land there. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. He's for you, not against you. He cheers our steps. If you've come in here, knees all busted, bloody elbows, needing some stitches, God's going, get up, come on, get back up. That was awesome. You, you, took, you took like five steps there. Last time it was just a step and a half. Last time you just let go of the coffee and fell right over. Get back up, I love you. I haven't changed my mind. I don't wanna mulligan your mind, come on. So this is where I want your mind to settle. I want you to get your eyes off of you. If you're like, I suck, you do suck. I'm terrible, you are terrible, you're worse than that. You probably think you're better than you are even if you're loathing. Please, get over you. God hadn't pushed all his chips in on you, he pushed all his chips in on Christ. 
Then he paid the bill in full. You don't owe anything. Repentance, confession, freedom. Get up. Let's pray.